Terwijl een verouderend en steeds armer Europa een ondoordringbaar fort wordt, opent Grootmacht China zijn grenzen. Het gevolg, jonge Afrikaanse migranten verleggen de koers naar China. Volgens experts ontstaat zo een nieuwe economische wereldorde waarbij het Westen het nakijken heeft. Met catastrofale gevolgen voor onze welvaart. Dit is wat u te wachten staat. Je kunt een paar in een week of twee weken maken. Het God bless me hier. God bless me. Uh, I believe that uh, this land of China is a promised land to me. Why is Europe unable to understand that the world we live in is a totally different world? That the uh, that the the future of the world uh, more and more won't be decided in the West. In fact, I predict that in 2030 Europe will be saying. Desperately, we want more Africans. Dit is tegenlicht. Welkom in een nieuwe economische wereldorde. Guangzhou, een stad van 15 miljoen inwoners, is vanaf haar ontstaan de grootste aanjager van de Chinese economie. Sinds begin deze eeuw zien we hier een gestaag groeiende stroom Afrikaanse immigranten. Vele van hen hebben over de hele wereld rondgezworven en zoeken nu hun geluk in China. Daarmee vormen ze de voorhoede van een verandering in de balans van de wereldeconomie. Met verstrekkende gevolgen voor het Westen. Tegenlicht ging daarom op bezoek in Nigeria Town, Guangzhou. Inmiddels thuishaven voor ruim een kwart miljoen Afrikanen. Ik heb in veel landen gegaan. Dit is niet mijn eerste plek waar ik ben. Ik heb in Frankrijk. Ik heb in Vietnam. Ik heb in Zuid-Korea. Ik heb in Hongkong. I have been to Macau. I have been to Singapore. My own view, China is leading. China is number one in the world now. Right now, as far as this world is concerned, China is leading. I was traveling to Portugal. I was traveling to Brazil. But I was checking in the clothes. I see that most of them is coming from China, made in China. I say, how? But they, I'm in Brazil. So must come mad in Brazil. So I said, okay. What I'm going to do in Europe and they are every, they, they, they are everything doing in China. So it's better to come straight to China. Why I came to Guangzhou is uh, because is uh, because of the weather condition here is not too cold like other cities in China, and here. I can be able to meet so many Nigerians from my tribe, Ibos. I will come have a collective or sort of a do joint business together. Because one man alone cannot be able to, to stand on his own. So when I got here, before coming here, I contacted a friend who had been here before me. He told me the kind of things they do in China, how to do it. So I was able to make up some money with the help of our collectives to be here. To start a business, uh, to earn a living. When I was in Nigeria, I don't have a family, I don't have a wife, I don't have a child. And really I'm looking for the money, it's not easy to be found. After I got uh, my visa to come down to China, I was surprised. I started a business with $100. Only hundred dollar. Sudden, sudden good five. You know, it's almost twenty thousand dollar. On doing that, I've got a house in Nigeria now, and uh, I've got a wife and two kids, and we're expecting the third one very soon. So, God bless me here. God bless me. Uh, I believe that uh, this land of China is a promised land to me. Migrants are the really smart people in society. They are the people who are explorers, who are innovators, who are risk takers. Ian Goldin, van origine Zuid-Afrikaan, was ooit economisch adviseur van Nelson Mandela 
en vicepresident van de Wereldbank. Tegenwoordig is hij hoogleraar globalisering en ontwikkeling aan de Universiteit van Oxford. Hij is ook directeur van de Oxford Martin School. Een denktank gericht op de grote problemen van de toekomst. The Chinese, uh, of course, have been all over Africa. I'm sure the Nigerians and others have been meeting Chinese coming there, talking about it. They realize if people come from somewhere with investment, they must have income, they must have opportunity. But they also know that they do things differently and that uh, so Africans can contribute. So clearly, Chinese investment in Africa will help Africans make a bridge to go back to China. Uh, and Chinese interest. There's also uh, in some parts of Africa, like Tanzania, uh, Mozambique, there's a political connection. The Chinese were extremely supportive of the fight against apartheid, of the liberation movements in Africa. Uh, many, many Africans studied in China, including the leadership of many political movements in Africa. So there's sort of a romantic attachment and, and political attachment to that these people helped us. We know it. You know, I've met many Africans that can speak Mandarin, for example, I've been trained there, doctors and nurses in Africa uh, that have been trained. So it's not, it's not virgin uh, territory. There are relations which go back a long way. Um, and I, those provide a bridge. The main thing I would say uh, is uh, migrants are entrepreneurs. I mean, they are, they are looking for opportunity. They're survival strategists. now China is leading their economy is booming do you know I surprised I saw somebody from Madagascar in China you can imagine if you check the map of Africa you can see where is Madagascar down down it is a little island I surprised they are here I have met a, a Libyan man being in China which is not which is impossible for any a Libyan man or a Libyan person to be in China but they are here why because their economy is booming. Yeah, I just here today. I had one year past our so I won't have gotten it. Whatever they are, what I go send over there. I'm going to get a kind of air condition and car with multi color. Then I will say I can choose where another 10 pieces again. And then cause that 10, 10. Chinese culture is quite different from Nigerian culture or even a new, somebody from Europe. But because we are here in their country, there's nothing he can do. You have to join the you have to join the chorus. There's nothing he can do. Whether their culture is good or bad, I don't focus my mind on that. What I focus is what they will produce for me or the business I have with them. That's my 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 main thing. That is it. That is it. On the way. Mobile phone accessories like the, the pass, the IC, the scream, earphones, you know, you can use to listen to the MP3. Also, oh, uh, I tried on motor pass, brake pass, repair kits for Toyota, Nissan, and Mercedes Benz. <laughs> So I have a and one of the most credit I have a time in the next 10 days. DVD pass, you know, DVD machine pass, TV pass, and so on. He is a I have a Lagos. Okay, and what you see, yeah, God bless you. Yeah, bye bye. Very clearly, China 
as a project to become, if not the main, at least a major world player. And in order to achieve this position, it needs to access whatever resources are necessary to build up its military, economic, or to a lesser extent, cultural power. And Africa is, uh, holds a strategic role in that uh, China's process of rising to, uh, to power. Achille Mbembe is filosoof en politicoloog, gepromoveerd aan de Sorbonne Universiteit in Parijs en tegenwoordig hoogleraar in Zuid-Afrika. Hij is de auteur van het standaardwerk On the Post Colony over de nieuwe relatie tussen Europa en Afrika. The Chinese have uh, shown that outside of the West they have the best expertise. Uh, in terms of how to get out of poverty. The West does have a lot of expertise in terms of how to get out of poverty in the West. I'm not sure that that expertise can be uh, uh, exported wholesale elsewhere. In any case, uh, since the years of colonialism, we haven't seen it uh, produce any major effect. So there is something in the Chinese model that speaks to, to us and that it needs to be, to be explored carefully in terms of how to, to create a, a better life for people. My customers, they are most from east part of Africa. They are coming to China for business. So for me, I will help them to get what they need and with better price, with better service so that they can make their business in their country have more uh, uh, good chance for the market. Now Africa is a developing country. They still like uh, maybe uh, like China 30 years ago. Why African come to China is because uh, the visa is very easy. That means Africans, they are very important to China. No, 25 boxes. Uh, 25 times 80, 2,000 pieces. I think the most important misunderstanding about migration is that how it's somehow other people, that we're not all migrants, and that the whole world has established itself. Our civilizations, the great places like Amsterdam, are the result of migration. Uh, this has always been historically the fact. In fact, we have lower levels of migration now than at many times in history uh, as a share of our populations. Uh, and we have more control now. Coming into Europe uh, is much more controlled than 100 years ago uh, when passports barely existed. So passports are a very new phenomena. The second big myth, I think, is that migrants take more than they give from society. All the evidence shows that migrants and migration contribute much more than they take, on average. Uh, and this is both for skilled and unskilled migrants. Uh, it's true in simply economic terms, so what they contribute to the economy uh, in indirect or direct taxes, in economic production uh, of goods and services, and also what they take in terms of maybe social security is lower than their aggregate contributions. But more importantly, uh, if one goes from the static period to the dynamic, then one sees that migrants are the source of economic dynamism. And all the great leaps in economic progress have resulted from migrants coming. And we see this most acutely in Silicon Valley. You know, half of the Silicon Valley startups, all the great iconic firms we can think of, the Googles, the Yahoos, Apples, are the result of very recent migrations. Uh, half the patents in the US. And if you think of people in the arts, Academy Award winners, Nobel Prize winners in academia, 
the share of these people in relation to migration is three, four, five times what you would expect from just the distribution in the population of migrants. So we know these people contribute ideas, they contribute investment, they contribute innovation. Uh, and we know our, stat our societies would be much more static and not as sustainable in terms of growth without them. So this, that's the second great myth, I think, that they take rather than give, and they're somehow bad for us as opposed to good for us. Our, the first challenge is uh, language and word differences. Not easy when you go to a foreign country or a new place. Yeah, through the help of uh, our friend and the Chinese friends that we were able to make, to have them uh, put it in more effort to learn the language. But it's very important for me to communicate. Not long time. Not time. No see you. Okay. <laughs> 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 Okay. I think the third great myth is that basically, uh, you know, we're going to be overwhelmed by poor people uh, coming from the rest of the world that will threaten our way of life. There is um, a lot of evidence now that the poorest people can't migrate. You know? Or when they do migrate, they go to a local village and then from the local village to the local town or city. They don't have the money. I mean, they're lucky if they can pay for a bus or get on the back of a truck to go to the local town. So the poorest people don't migrate. The differences are so many. The way Chinese think from the way Nigerians think. And especially this black color. You know, when they see you, they feel, you know, I got some students, they will, sometimes they will come to you and say, oh, why are you so black? Why, why, you don't take your bath? I say, oh no, <laughs> I take my bath every time. You know, sometimes some Chinese will come to you and like take your hand and like they really want to see you if this thing will peel off. Do you understand? It's a very big challenge, you know. But it's really not a problem to me because I know I am who I am. Of course, I'm an, I'm an African and God created me like this. So, can you show me which ones are the 100% in my hair? This one. You know, in my country, you know, in my country, they 
can easily recognize which one is a 100% woman hair and which one is not a 100%. My products is about beauty. Women, they are like beauty in this world, special Africans. Yeah, so special the, because of the nature here, um, they can grow like a street of so long. Um, so they need to find some ways make the hair to be better. So th they can change, change, look like m more beautiful. Like when I came, I came to Beijing. That's the first place I landed. And when I landed in Beijing, Chinese people were looking at me. I can just say during that time, they have never seen a lot of blacks. Maybe they see blacks in the TV, through MBA, and so on and so forth. So during that time, there's not body, there's not, there, there's black people, but no too many of them. You understand me? So from there, I took a train to Guangzhou and stayed with my brother. Right now, it's not like before. Now, many Chinese people have knew that black exists. It's not like before. So they cooperate with blacks now. Most of the Africans, they marry Chinese, and so on and so forth. So I really don't think I can stay in China for so long, 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 settle down here, you know. One, I can never get married to a Chinese. Do you understand? If I can get married to a Chinese, then I can say, okay, I can stay in China for a long time, maybe 20 years, 30 years, when I get a husband here. But I don't think I can. So in that area, no. Right now, I'm not planning to go back to Nigeria. So I think the best way is to bring my wife here because she miss me a lot every time. Whenever I call her, she complain a lot. Daddy, I miss you. He left me back home. I'm crying, this and that, you know? So I think it's the best thing is to bring my wife here because it's good to live with your wife so that he can plan future. I mean, because of the children. It's not going to be difficult if, he, if I have the money. <laughs> you know, see, if I have the money, I, getting the passport, Nigerian passport, then I go to the embassy and apply with the invitation letter. It's not hard. If you follow the procedure, they will give you the visa. My last trip to China was uh, two years ago. I was going to Shanghai. I went to the Chinese consulate in, in Johannesburg. And uh, being granted a visa was the easiest thing I have ever seen. I was completely astonished. I got a visa in one day. I filled a form, a one-page form. They didn't want to know who was my father, who was my mother, almost nothing about where I was born. Uh, they hardly asked me whether I had any money. They wanted to know whether I wanted to pay uh, 600 rands, in which case I would have had the visa exactly the same day or whether I wanted to pay 300 and then it would take maybe two days, that was it. So the, the conditions of access are, are, are not the same in Europe, of course. Europe has become, as we all know, a fortress. It's living under the uh, illusion that uh, you can have a, a community without strangers. It is inhabited in its very soul by a strong desire for apartheid. Uh, separateness, uh, all of that uh, is, uh, is known. Uh, it doesn't seem to me that in relation to China uh, it's the same situation. So of course, migratory uh, uh, circuits in Africa have been more or less completely reoriented. They are moving towards the east, people coming here and less and less people go into Europe, in spite of the hysteria about African immigration in Europe. Uh, going to Europe or United States, their procedure, I mean, things you will bring, the documents you will bring, is so difficult. 
It's so difficult. It's not easy. But in China, immediately you get your passport. Like when, when we came, it's with your passport and invitation letter. But now, if you bring your passport, even if you don't want to go direct to the embassy, if you meet any, any Nigerian agent and agree with the money, you accepted the money between both of you, you will just get a visa. So it's quite easy. And you know, in Europe or USA, you cannot give an agent <laughs> the documents. You have to apply face to face. But in China, in, in Chinese embassy, it's not like that. You can go by yourself, you can give an agent to apply for you. I don't know what I I don't know what I want. No rice. None of rice. I want a good I don't want to go. I have a fabulous idea. Maybe, 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 Make sure I saw the from my phone. I'm catfish. Good drinks, original one. I tried, I said, to reach a web with the image Africa. Yeah. The African image. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. When we are going to Europe, we start countering the problem of visa. For you to get visa, you know, it takes a long time. Then, and when it's taking a long time, your business cannot be okay. Then we start looking at another country. We start going to Japan. Then when the Japan visa start also very difficult to get, we move to Taiwan. Then from Taiwan to Hong Kong, from Hong Kong to China. When you send goods to Nigeria, from the money they raised that place, you tell them to send social amount to my mother. Times I send goods, I tell them take hundred thousand because if you take one thousand dollar here to send to Nigeria, it doesn't make sense because you can bought a goods which you can realize profit of. Uh, two thousand. You can put a goods of two thousand, one thousand dollar, which can have a profit of three hundred dollar on it. So when you send the goods from that three hundred dollar, and your mind is to give your mother hundred dollar, you add it with that three hundred dollar. It's four hundred dollar you give to that woman. But if you send one thousand dollar, you don't have any profit. Ten, eleven, You can make five thousand dollars a week. Or two weeks. Depends. The business contact or connection that comes here comes your way then that time. Maybe you have a customer who is who is sourcing for, for an item. You want to buy a container of it, on that container of the goes maybe one or two containers. It depends on the business that comes your way. A month you can make ten thousand dollars. I mean three thousand dollars. Even within a week, even two weeks, depends. It's not accurate or specific that you must make this amount of money. So that you can say within the moon you cannot get up to one dollar. It depends. No, it's not Every day the local Nigerian traders resident in China here, not the cash going through bank, but the cash going through airport day by day by hand you understand because people need cash every day and people moving goods to africa every day you understand by air so you need cash every day by air you need you need move your goods every day by air to africa you understand steady business you understand but if there is any blockage that the cash cannot move then the product cannot move, you understand? So every day, let's say Nigerian citizen, we are moving 20 to 30 millions by cash.
I predict that in 2030, Europe will be saying desperately, we want more Africans. You know, we're going to need them to push us elderly people around in our wheelchairs yeah. <laughs> and, and to do many things because the labor force in Europe is contracting dramatically. So the demography matters a lot. Dependency ratios, which is the ratio of elderly people and young people under working age to the working population, are changing dramatically around the world. And they're two real drivers of this change. The one is that people are living longer and longer. The other trend is collapsing fertility. Lots of elderly people, very much fewer younger people, and the middle group having to pay the taxes and earn the income for these big, heavy dependents at the top. So the dependency ratio is increasing dramatically everywhere. The mean average age of people is increasing dramatically everywhere. You know, there are societies, particularly the North African societies, which have been going through the Arab Spring, where average age is something like 21 or 22. But in Europe, it's rapidly going over 30, and in Japan, it's going over 35, uh, 40, average. Uh, and it's heading up over the 40s for average age of society. This changes a lot of things. It has important implications for migration. Uh, Africa is going through a slower transition. It is going through the same transition, but it's lagging behind. That means that there will be lots of Africans coming into the workforce. It will be the biggest workforce in the world. It's already overtaken Europe. It will overtake China in about 15 years' time and India. In Europe, we're going to have a big problem. Uh, now, remember that because there's so few um, young people or middle-aged people relative to older people, the elderly will dominate politics. Okay? They will dominate the voting. So they will make sure that they look after themselves uh, in terms of trying to maintain pensions and social security, etc. But we won't be able to afford it because uh, the other thing that's happening is that the financial markets have collapsed and with it our savings. So the idea that when these things were constructed, they were constructed with an expectation of average returns on the savings of maybe 5% risk-free rail. You know, that seems like a dreamland now. So there's no way, you know, average risk-free returns now maybe 1% if we're lucky. That means you have to work a lot more in order to have the same amount of saving to live on. The numbers suggest that the OECD, that's the rich country workforce, if we, don't, if we assume entry and exit at about the same levels as now, when people come into the labor force and when they leave it, about the same as now, goes down from about 800 million to about 600 million people over the next 35 years. It's a dramatic decline in working age population, uh, just driven by demography. And that means a number of things. One is we'll need more migrants. Uh, but even if migrants were 10 times the current level, it still wouldn't compensate for this gap in the labor market. Uh, China has managed this better because it has a mass migration out of the countryside. Its migration has been internal. So it's a huge country and it's releasing perhaps the biggest migration in human history of people over the last 30 years from the countryside. You know, 500 million people maybe. Uh, so this release of people from the countryside has been the source of migration. There's still maybe another 100 million to go or something like that, but the numbers are declining rapidly. Uh, when that is exhausted, then China increasingly will be drawing on the rest of the world. So I believe in the future there will be real competition for scarce labor. So a war on the talent, but not only the talented, also the untalented will be really searching.
I'm fine, you know? Nah, but okay, nah, I'll just stay there, nah. Yeah, because uh, we hope today we'll be okay. We'll be too bad. Yeah, we, just, we just started. Nah, we are just going to open it. Nah, we still need to have faith on there. Yes, we have faith on there. I wonder if you have your open your shop. Yes, my, look at my shop there, you know? Yeah, but today, today, God, God, will bless us today. Yeah, 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 yeah. God, God bless us today. Yes. So, I see, I see a song. Nah, they're okay, they're okay. They're just passing like the photos. Thank God. Thank God. Why is Europe unable to understand that the world we live in is a totally different world? That the, uh, that the, the future of the world uh, more and more won't be decided in the West. That the center of the world has, has been displaced. It's somewhere else. Uh, why? Uh, is it that Europe is having difficulties coming to terms with, with that? There are numerous explanations. The uh, embrace by the West and some other uh, non-Western countries of the, uh, the doctrine of globalization, of the free flow of goods, most of the times at the expense of the free flow of people, um, has a number of consequences, one of them being um, the fact that our world is uh, more and more uh, divided between those who can move and those who cannot move or can only do so under ever more drastic conditions. A phenomenon that in turn leads to the uh, militarization of boundaries and the fact that borders have become uh, somewhat understood more and more, not only in police terms, but also as war zones, uh, where uh, war against foreigners is, is conducted. And all of this is uh, translated into new norms, juridical norms, which contradict fundamentally the democratic ideals Western countries pretend to, to be premised upon. The most interesting thought experiment on free migration is Europe. Okay. And, you know, it's the only place in the world which has taken away border controls of a large number of, of economies. And uh, what's amazing about it is how well it's worked how few Europeans move inside Europe. In the economic crisis in Southern Europe now, Spain has 50% youth unemployment. How many Spaniards are there looking for a job on the streets of Amsterdam? Very few. How many Greeks are there? Very few. So what, one of the things that we've learned through the economic crisis and through Europe is A, when you take down borders, you don't get mass migration. Uh, and B, it's very determined by the need on the economy, not the supply. It's a, it's a very strange thing for an economist who started up learning the works of John Stuart Mill and Adam Smith and these people, because when you read these people that many of the neoclassical, more liberal economists now regard as their high priests, uh, they talk absolutely about free movement of labor as being essential for their concepts of economic freedom. That distinction comes much later. Uh, and it's really at, at the time of the First World War when passports become systematized. So it's a recent phenomena and it's getting worse not better, and the technologies in some respects are making it worse. So retina scans, fingerprints, you know, it's it getting harder and harder uh, to be in a society illegally. So economics has moved to a situation where many of the liberal uh, uh, economists, including you know, great uh, liberal politicians uh, in Britain, in Europe, in the US, push for more and more free market in trades of goods, and services and capital, uh, but tighter and tighter controls over labor. There's no economic explanation for this whatsoever. 
Okay. It's this is just bad economics. But during the time of Europe and America, we only getting things between government. You understand? But individually, we don't. But China today, you can be in China doing business, doing very well. Maybe you can have a contract with a Chinese factory or Chinese company to go back to Africa and invest. You understand? So there is quite different. Hello? Window, yeah? I got, yeah, Tony, Tony speaking. It's what I'm one of I'm not going to say, because you want to kill me, you want to kill me. Yeah, the, the container, I know there are about four containers. A container, four. I know. I'm working with my gang, I'm here. I'm with you. I'm going to kill me. I'm not going to send you to me. I'm going to go, 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 I'm going to go. Or <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, last time I hear he said he owes them about 10, yeah, 10 million, 10 million, 10 million dollars. There's a simple solution to it, of course, which is lowering the border controls and increasing uh, the attractiveness. Also, there's many things we could do to support migration which would make it better. For example, little things like making pensions portable. So you work somewhere, when you stop working, you can take your pension home with you. Encourages you to go home and enjoy it. There are lots of British people living in the south of Spain, enjoying British pensions. They couldn't do that if they go to some, you know, Africans can't do that when they go home. Um, so creating things like that, which encourage people to go home and just be there when they're working, uh, are important. Uh, there's all sorts of issues um, regarding multiple entry visas. Many people, once they come in, and this is a great problem in terms of undocumented workers, they come in, they overstay their visa or they start working, they, and then they never leave because they feel if they go to the airport or a port, they'll be arrested, they'll never be allowed in again. So they don't leave. So they're trapped, and this is a big issue. 11 million people in the US undocumented. Uh, it's big numbers. And I think making migrants feel that they can be regularized, come and go, easier. And the decoration has to be the same uniform. Yes. You understand? I understand, sir. So that it will not be different design or different color. Mm -hmm. It has to be one color. Uh -huh. To have a beautiful design outlook. outlook. Yeah. Okay. Hmm? In your kitchen you have the restaurant in that uh, kitchen joy in that uh, border. Have one restaurant. That uh, cooker is very nice. The cooker is very nice. It's a good good man. Is it Chinese? It's yeah. Chinese. If you one person share uh, I don't know how to say if the one person, you know Hold that money. That's a cost of many problems. So when the money you should properly share, and everybody be happy, and then this the boom and boom continue and continue. But the only thing is that the Chinese, you know, like money more than anything. <laughs> no. <laughs> the stage is uh, being set for a new map of the world. Uh, in which we have on the one hand uh, the West where she's basically a dormant, complacent and nostalgic society worried about what it used to be 
and uh, not knowing very much anything about where it wants to, to go. And yes, I would say dynamic regions of the world, China, of course, India, of course, Brazil, Africa for that matter, soon uh, more than a billion people, uh, people in motion, uh, uh, the emergence of, a new, of new societies. Europe's in a terrible crisis now. Uh, it's in a crisis of survival of the euro. It's in a crisis of politics, short-termism, um, and it's clearly got to overcome its short-term issues of debt, unemployment, etc. In that environment, it's very difficult for people to think strategically about issues like migration. When people feel a crisis or become unemployed, they naturally become more conservative. They become nationalistic, they become protectionist, uh, they become xenophobic. They blame their problems on the other, the outsider. This is something we've always done as humans. It's not, we created the problem, it's they created it. The best solution is to keep them out, then our problems will be solved. Whether it's people or whether it's other things, goods and services, investments, etc. And we see this in Europe a lot now. I think this would be terribly self-destructive. It's short-termism. And in the medium term, everyone uh, is the loser. But it's understandable as a political process. So my hope is that Europe transitions out of this crisis quickly. I don't think we can expect much better policies on migration during the crisis. But my hope is that we will transition out of it, that we will learn from the crisis that actually people didn't come from Southern Europe when they were free to come, that migration isn't the threat we think it is. I was traveling to Brazil. I have been to South Korea. We moved to Taiwan. I have been to Hong Kong. I have been to Macau. Then from Taiwan to Hong Kong. I have been to Singapore. From Hong Kong to China. You see? Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries.